Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by Fred and Lou Hartwig and viewers like you. Thank you. Well, good evening. Welcome to Ruckus, that weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly and our topics tonight. Hillary and Marco are in. Uber may be out. And constitutional carry carries the day. Plus roast and toast. But we start in Kansas with a metro area legislator who is unhappy with the way school finance issues are being handled. The most recent controversy involves the dumping of the school finance formula and the implementation of a block grant system. To talk about these issues and more is Representative Melissa Rooker of Fairway, a Republican, and likely the only member of the legislature who ever worked for Clint Eastwood. Representative Rooker, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. We'll talk about Clint later, if we may. Let's sure. start with the legislature. I read a lot of stories about you, and you're often referred to as a moderate Republican. Is that a fair characterization of your philosophy? You know, I consider myself a Republican. I don't like the labels. Um, I th I'm a more traditional Republican in the, the, the mold of Dole and Eisenhower and Kassebaum, um, fiscally conservative. I think we today delve into areas that um, traditionally the Republican Party was never really concerned with too deep into people's personal lives and choices. And I, I would prefer to stay focused on the issues that, that matter economically and um, you know, let people manage their personal lives on their own. Well, one issue where I bet you differ from a lot of conservatives is the financing of school education in the state of Kansas. Uh, we don't have tons of time, as you know, but give us the Cliff Notes version of what you are concerned about with regard to school finance in the state. Well, I'm concerned that we are underfunding our schools and this plan to the block grant plan repealed the existing school finance formula, which takes care of the, the extra needs of, of some of our students who are more expensive to educate. Um, we've repealed the formula. We have a block grant, so funding will be static for the next two years. And it rolls back some of the, the funding for operating expenses and puts money into the retirement system, which is a different need a, and certainly is a valid expense, but it is at the expense of our classroom but, spending. But, but a lot of people didn't like the previous formula and the formula before that. As long as I can recall, last 20 years or so, there have been strong debates about financing of public schools in the state of Kansas, and nobody seems to agree on what's the best approach. Well, the formula that we had was, was um, several times over litigated and deemed constitutional, but what was determined is that we aren't keeping up with the cost of inflation and the changing needs of our schools, so um, funding fell behind. We, we have been on a cycle of budget cuts since 2008, started due to the Great Recession, and continues because of the tax plan that Kansas enacted in 2012. So is the answer, at least in part, to increase taxes? I think we have to address the revenue shortfall. We have a $600 million budget gap, and we have thrown our, our tax system out of balance. So we've got to get back to reason and rationality. The state is not supposed to run a deficit, but we're keeping the state budget afloat through bonding in our transportation system. We've now passed a bill to bond in the, um, to refinance some of the debt in the CAPER system, the retirement system. We're using the cash to keep the state general fund afloat. Well, and no one seems to know exactly what the Constitution means by saying make suitable provision for the financing of education. Well, I think suitable provision means that the schools have enough to get their job done. But we don't know how much that is. We do. We can we, certainly find out. How, how, how do much we that determine is. that? We we do. We have cost studies. We we can do. A, we can refresh the studies. There there are real world costs to educate our kids, and but, we're ignoring them. But in any financing system for schools, you have some school districts that love the formula and others that don't like the formula. It doesn't mean you throw the entire thing out. It means that you address. We have ten years of post audit studies that that point the way to ways that we can improve the formula. Has any thought been given to a constitutional amendment? that would set a percentage of total revenues as the amount of money 
to uh, spend for education? I don't think that's the way to do it. You, your revenues can shift and change all the time. That That is not moored in the, the real world costs of educating our kids. Well, it would set the floor for financing the, the floor cost, well, say 25% of total revenues. I, I disagree with okay. that approach. Consolidation, is that a possibility at Consolidation all? Consolidation happens naturally and is happening, has been happening. We, we have fewer districts today than we did 10 years ago. The districts in the state leverage their resources through service centers and co-ops. They, they work with each other to provide shared services. So we're already doing consolidation. Now enough for all this boring stuff. What about Clint Eastwood? What did you do when you uh, worked for Clint Eastwood in California? Well, I spent 15 years working for him and, and became his VP of of development, so I managed all the scripts that were submitted and worked with the writers when we chose a project. Are you still in touch with him? My husband is. I'm, I left in 2001, um, stayed home to raise my kids for for a number of years, and um, so. As far as we know, Mr. Eastwood is doing well He's and doing well. Uh, right. prospering in the business. He's Just had a big hit not long ago, as I yeah. recall. Listen, it was nice to meet you. I enjoyed too. the conversation. Thank you for coming by. Thank you. That is Kansas State Representative Melissa Rooker of Fairway. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Mary Ann Murray Simons is a freelance journalist and consultant. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Steve Glorioso is one of the region's premier political and media consultants. And Ron Freeman is a motivational speaker and author and former executive director of the Kansas GOP. Critics of Kansas are now armed with one more weapon. The state legislature has approved and the governor has signed a bill allowing residents 21 and older to carry concealed weapons without first undergoing a background check and training. It is no longer necessary to get a state permit unless you plan to take the gun outside Kansas. This law takes effect in July. It is already legal for Kansans to carry weapons openly. The newer process is called constitutional carry and Kansas is the sixth state in the country to adopt such a law. So, Ron, will constitutional carry turn the Sunflower State into bleeding Kansas once again? Mike, <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, and I think that's what you hear, the shrieks and howls of the left, that somehow we're going to have the morgues are going to be more busy, the police are going to have more gun crimes investigated, and, you know, that's just simply not the case. You look at the states that have done it, that's not a problem. You haven't seen Vermont, for example, as a state. Uh, Alaska, none of those have high gun crime, crime uh, rates like Washington, D.C. However, when you look at this situation, bad guys, they're already doing it. They're carrying their guns, they're gonna shoot people. They do that. And now you're saying to the good guys, if you wanna defend yourself, we're gonna give you that right. There's nothing wrong with well, that. Well, it's such a good idea. Why do only six states have the law? You know, I, I, can, I can tell you because the rest haven't caught on yet because liberals have more influence there. That's, it's really that simple. Totally, totally. Well, let's ask a liberal, yeah. Steve Glorioso. I'm just floored. Uh, you, you can go to about a 20 other dem democratic uh, you know, countries, democracies, and you find that they don't allow people to carry a gun into a nice. TV show like this. <laughs> well, care what that I is. mean, this is it. It is absolutely insane. But where's the harm? That, you know, England, Sweden, uh, Norway. I mean, the states that have on. done it, where's the harm? Come on, you know. You know, here, here's the problem. You, you have no background check now. And, right. and law enforcement, God forbid we pay any attention to them, are worried about the lack of training. That's this idea that this is a constitutional thing is BS. The Supreme Court did not say, matter of fact, they did say you can have reasonable restrictions. The decision only said that the gun right is a personal right rather than a group like a militia. And well, they've now taken, the, the, they've taken the this thing. Okay, how about no licenses for driving a car? I, I don't think the Supreme Court said you have to have a state permit to carry a gun. Well, you should no. have no, some it just training. Said that I, mean, I don't think it addressed that. I don't think it addressed that. It simply said it's an individual, not a group right. Well, but it did say you could have reasonable restrictions. Right. Eight hours and of training we is have, good, we but have, it's not well, going to make you the responsible citizen. Just eight hours of training is not going to make you responsible. It's ridiculous to have anyone carrying a weapon. Of course, criminals are going to have weapons, but for people who say that we want this gun to protect our property and our lives, police officers have to have training to carry guns. Why would we allow just any civilian to walk the street strapped with the weapon and not be trained in how to use that weapon properly? They're just as dangerous as a criminal because well, if something goes wrong. That sounds good, and, and you can see, you can look at these cases the where it, when, it when police officers are the well states trained. states don't have the problem. On Kansas City Week in Review last week, Nick Haynes had several legislators in from Missouri and Kansas. One was Jeff Melcher, a Republican from Johnson County. Here is what he had to say about constitutional carry. 
Kansas has been a an open carry state since the 1800s, so you can carry a firearm uh, right now uh, on the streets as long as it's not concealed. So um, allowing them to be able to put a jacket on over their gun um, it really isn't as extreme as it might sound on the surface. And there's six other states that do some form of this currently. Crime's not out of control there. Um, I don't see it as a problem. Marianne, the Kansas image gets kicked around quite a bit by the national media. Is this going to uh, bolster the image or cause it further harm, do you think? I think it's really sad. I, I, I feel badly that uh, issues like this are taking the forefront rather than what Kansas really is. There are so many issues that have sort of sidetracked the real agenda and not training people to carry a weapon that is potentially fatal is a huge mistake and we're going to find that out and 78 percent of Kansans are currently saying they support training for those who carry weaponry. We we just I well, don't understand. What's interesting is D.C.'s gun crime rate is like 12 times that of Kansas, and to pretend that somehow oh it's going to fall apart now? No, it's not. Well, well I, you know, I didn't say fall apart. I said oh, training. You know, why, training. Well, no, why, why the and, why the earth is turning over in this grave? Because back in Dodge City, now. no, <laughs> you had to check your guns at the city limit. Why? Because why the earth understood you people running around with guns Steve. kill people. <laughs> Steve, you, Steve, you and I can remember, and probably the other Why folks can, too. Yeah. Uh, that, you were there. That, uh, I wasn't. Uh, a few years ago, when concealed carry was coming into existence in Missouri, there was all sorts of panic about the blood running in the streets, and the same concern when we found out that open carry was permissible in Missouri and in Kansas. But none of that has happened, has it? I just repeat, all the countries in the world who have strict gun control have murder matter. rates that are infantile compared to what we have matter. in the crazy U.S. of America. All right, matter. the comments by prop master Steve Glorioso <laughs> in this segment. Uber's ride may be over, at least in Kansas and in Kansas City, Missouri. The so-called ride-hailing or ride-sharing company is at odds with the Kansas legislature and the Kansas City Council over rules of the road, such as what insurance coverage is required and what will license fees cost. Uber and similar companies such as Lyft connect with passengers through apps on smartphones. The drivers are part-time workers who use their own vehicles. While no final decision has been reached, Uber officials say they cannot afford the price to operate in either Kansas City, Missouri, or in Kansas. So, Steve, is this a cause for concern for area residents? Well, first of all, I did some uh, work for Lyft. Uh, I, I'm not currently uh, under contract, but uh, the, the service is really terrific. It, the, the, it, it really is. Uh, people, even the mayor, who went off pretty harsh on Uber, when he goes to Washington, he uses Uber. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he makes that very plain. When my stepdaughter comes here from Washington, she uses it all the time with her friends, go out at night, be able to, to come home. The cabs just don't cut it. Um, one of the TV channels sat at a cafe in, I think, Overland Park. They called the cab. It took 30 minutes to get there. They got out their smartphone, hit an Uber link, and Uber was there in four minutes. And uh, so, but the problem is you have to have some regulation for safety and insurance. And Uber is playing hardball. They're a huge company, uh, $40 billion. Uh, but I think Lyft will, will come back. They, they kind of got off the road because they were in a lawsuit with the city. I think it'll survive. There'll be a, a median so. place. Lyft suspended operations. Yes. The case went to court, as I recall, and it's then now it was in recess. It's now and, with the and, new ordinance. And you think it's likely Lyft will get back in the game now that it appears Uber may be out? Well, I think they both will, actually. You well, know, Lyft they, is willing to go along with the city yes, regulations. Yes, and they negotiated some well, of these changes. When you're not at the table, changes. you're going to be willing to, to work well, with Well, that's them, exactly right? right. You can't negotiate if you yeah. refuse to come to the table. Yeah. Uh, you know, the mayor said David Flum, who was one of Obama's chiefs, can't, you know, now work for Uber, tried to call him 10 minutes before the meeting to stop this ordinance. And they played it all wrong. And uh, But it is a service we ought to have in Kansas City. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, I agree Gwen, uh, some people claim that this debate's going to hurt Kansas City's image, its growing reputation as a tech hub, an innovative area. Well, you know, I don't know how much it'll hurt that reputation, but I certainly think it it, it is a grave concern when you say you want to attract millennials, you want to attract innovation and technology, and that's exactly what Uber is about. It's a, they have a, um, 
an app, a mobile app platform. It allows young people to do as my niece and my uh, daughter's friends when they come to town. They use Uber so they can go out. They don't have to have a designated driver if they're at the clubs and they can get home safely quickly. And uh, no cash is, is exchanged in the in the transaction, which is something that. Uh, contributes to safety and and, and probably is a deterrent to uh, taxi drivers are getting robbed and things like that. I mean, you know, the problem here is innovation has ha, is has collided with regulations. Certainly, they need to be regulated, but how do we get to the point of regulating? In a, in a fair way, because you can't regulate them the exact same way you regulate taxi Why not? Right. Because Why it's not, not a Why taxi service. It is a ride share service. It's not a taxi service. Should they have insurance? Yes. Should there be background checks for drivers? Yes. It's my understanding that they do both of well, those Well, what's the distinction? Things. They have those things right. in place. The, th the thing about it is I could decide, uh, you know, I want to go out and earn a little extra cash, and I think I'll do, I'll do some ride sharing uh, with Uber for only a few months. I'm not going to do it as my uh, way of making a living for the entire year. I'm only going to do it for two or three months, but the city wants Uber to pay for every driver for a full year if they use their vehicle. And that, I think, is the problem within uh, one of the major problems in the yeah. negotiation Part of process. the problem, too, is that Uber is not taking responsibility as a company, claiming they're a technology company, not a transportation <laughs> yeah, company. Right. That's so true. they want to be true. That's a threat. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't agree well, with that. Yeah, I mean, I, well, what problem are they solving by imposing regulations? If you're driving people away, you're creating a negative in terms of public image. And it's like, what's the benefit of, yeah, of, of the, the again, insurance companies make more they've money? They've got to find that they've balance find, between. They've got to meet in the middle. Well, yeah. I, I, There's a compromise I, somewhere here, and they I need to find it. I interviewed Bill George from Yellow Cab mm -hmm. on this program a few and weeks ago. Kelvin Simmons, too, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah, and Kelvin Simmons speaking on behalf of Lyft. And uh, Bill George's point was, we just want, we, the cab company, just want to be treated fairly. The same and person, the same the same person who blocked out independent cab, on, uh, cab right. owners from getting access to hotels downtown yeah. wants yeah. to be treated fairly. It, interestingly <laughs> enough. There's a lobbyist somewhere in this. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> interestingly enough, in Missouri, several pieces of legislation are being considered by, by the state, one of which would remove Kansas City and other cities from having any power to regulate Uber and similar companies. And so uh, I think Uber is going to wait around and see if, in fact, yeah. that bill becomes law in it, the state of Missouri. It has happened in, in uh, some other states. Well, they the state where they can't left. regulate. Where the yeah. state, the state they, they got the state law passed, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. For the second time, Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. will try to become the second Clinton and the first woman elected president of the United States. The former first lady, U.S. senator and secretary of state, rolled out her campaign with a video on social media saying Americans have fought their way back from tough economic times, but the deck is still stacked in favor of those at the top. As one would expect, the rollout was satirized on NBC's SNL. <laughs> now, since we're announcing your candidacy via social media, we thought it would be fun if you actually filmed the video yourself on your own phone. This time, maybe focus on all that you've done for women's rights. Oh, okay, that's good. I am running because I want to be a voice for women everywhere. Did someone say women everywhere? <laughs> Bill, notwithstanding, what do you see as the biggest challenge Hillary faces in trying to become president, Marianne? Well, there are a couple of issues. I, I love the um, campaign hook that she's using, which is champion of families. I think that's an excellent uh, platform from which to build. <laughs> The problem is I'm not sure that everyone understands that she is part of the middle class and she's huh? talking. She is? She, no, she's oh, talking really? about she's a separation right. between the middle class <laughs> and the upper class and I'm not sure that she can make that distinction in her life with what she has been able to accomplish and I'm also not sure that everyone buys the sincerity of Hillary. Do you think she's yeah. going to get any real challenge well. from other Democrats for the nomination or does she essentially have it sewn up at this I point? I don't think so. I think there are a lot in the Democratic Party who are looking for um, others who might step forward and there are a couple who are considering a run who are a little bit hesitant. Gwen, as an analyst and not an advocate, <laughs> right? as an analyst, not an advocate, and what's, the, what's, the biggest, what's the biggest challenge that uh, Hillary Clinton faces in becoming president? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I agree in, with some of, of what uh, Mary just said, but 
I think the biggest challenge for her right now is that is being tied to which which some of the attack ads that have already started or are doing is pinning her, tying her to the past. And so having her, the Clinton legacy, um, tie, being tied to uh, President Obama, I think those are the things she's going to have to really work hard to uh, overcome. And, I, and you can see that in the, in the way that she's uh, uh, framing her campaign now. She's trying to have a, a more future forward uh, focus with her logo, which has also become an issue. Uh, but I think that's their biggest piece is, is, is how is she going to govern? How is she going to lead in this new environment based and, and not bring forward all of the issues of the past that they're going to you know, put on her? Well, and Freeman, she, she, uh, she's going to be the nominee. Yeah. This is not a campaign, it's a coordination. She's going to be the nominee. I don't think there's a question about that, but what's she going to run on? Because she has no significant accomplishments. She legislatively, she hasn't got it done. And at that, the bottom line, she doesn't have a platform to say, I, I did this and I did this, because it's not there. Uh, the Republican race for president is going to be extremely interesting. And uh, always a couple is. of days ago, <laughs> uh, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, I think a very impressive member of the party, rolled out his presidential campaign. What are your thoughts about Rubio? I like him. I think he's sound. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I don't have a horse in the race at this point in time. I'm gonna wait and see. Who steps well, let me ask you what I horses. asked about Clinton. What, right? what would be Rubio's biggest challenge in becoming president? What would keep him from it, other than not getting the nomination? But <laughs> well, I, 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 yeah, that would be a problem. You know what? I, I think he's got a. I think he's solid. I think he has some issues with some of the more. Um, people right of me, let's just say it that way. Are there people uh, right the, of you? Uh, not that I know You're of, but they, about think, they think they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Guys like him. I, I uh, want to switch to local uh, politics a little bit here because uh, neither Gwen nor Steve were here last week when we talked about the election and both are uh, shrewd and close watchers of what goes on in Kansas City politics. So, Steve, any uh, analysis, any thoughts you want to add about what happened last week? Any council races we ought to be paying special attention to? Well, I uh, actually got the hiccups on election night laughing throughout the night at Clay Chastain finishing third. I think he got, what, four or five percent. Um, so, I mean, he, he got to understand that the people of Kansas City detest him and they want him to go and stay away. Not all Never, of them. Yeah, a, a whole 4% or whatever. The 7%. But, but the fact is is that they, uh, you know, the mayor, of course, got going to be reelected. There's right. about three races that are going to be very interesting. And that's 1st District up north where Dick Davis is the incumbent. The 6th District where Kevin McManus did, did a pretty strong race. The 2nd at large, Teresa Lohr and Jay Hodges. And the 5th District with Kim Bacchus and Ms. Uh, Candia. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, but uh, we hope people will come out and vote. The election's not until June now. We, we, string, we lengthen it. And, uh, but there's a lot of issues that aren't being discussed. I, I, I'm for Sly James, but I wish he'd had a serious opponent so he would have to say what he's going to do in his second term and defend his record. It's, it's a good record, but defend it. Gwen, quick analysis of what happened last week. What are your thoughts are? Yeah, I, I agree pretty much with what Steve is saying. I, I think the two uh, most important races that, that we'll be watching will be Bacchus and Kennedy in the 5th District, and, and uh, that's, a, that's a race, in my view, that is the race that's uh, the choice is between experience in city government uh, and inexperience. And the fifth district needs experience. We need exper people who are experienced at getting ordinances passed, at doing housing and economic development, those types of things. That's what we need at city at city hall, and that's so that's going to be a piece there. In the um, uh, C Catherine Shields and uh, Glover, that's, that's the other hot, the that's other. the other hot race. All right, got to move on now. It is time for roast and toast, where the Ruckettes offer a pat on the back or a kick in the pants. To people and events in the news, we start first with Mary Ann Murray Simons. My toast is for the Corporon and Lamano families and the thousands of others who were a part of the seven days events that wrapped up on Monday of this week. I was really fortunate to be able to participate on Monday in the mass for Reed Underwood, Dr. Bill Corporon, and Terry Lamano. I was at the Jewish Community Center for the walk that was 3,000 plus strong and then went to the Church of the Resurrection for a wonderful culmination event that uh, really drew together the best of the best. And it proves to me, I think, that good defeats evil every time. Steve. I'm going to do a toast 
the president, our president, for opening up relations with Cuba. For half a century, a century, we isolated that country, which pushed them into the arms of the Soviets and pretty much condemned the Cuban people to, to living in substandard conditions. It's always been more about U.S. domestic policy than, than really caring about Cuba. What, uh, the, at the same time that uh, Cuba, conservative Republicans scream and yell about Mexicans wanting to come to this country for a better life, we allowed Cubans looking for a better life to have immediate visa status the minute they stepped on our soil. So it's good that the policy will change. I think it will open up the country and it should lead to a better life and a better future for the Cuban people. Gwen. My toast is to the thousands of minimum wage workers who continue to keep the spotlight on the need to raise the minimum wage to a livable wage of $15 an hour in Kansas City. It is my hope that the city council will step up and, and act on behalf of hardworking, low-wage earners to ensure that we provide a better quality of life for people in Kansas City. And the hesitancy to move forward based on state law is unfounded. There is such an ordinance in St. Louis, and if there is a problem, let's deal with it in the courts. Ron. Mike, I want to toast the Kansas City Royals for continuing their winning ways. And it's much more than just a sport. Excuse me, because it energizes the city. People are excited, but more importantly, for the economy, people are coming here. It's a destination, and it's making a huge impact, and they're doing it the right way. It's choking you up. It's, it is. <laughs> very well Finally, a well-deserved <laughs> toast to those Wyandotte County voters who refused to put up with the annex of Commissioner Terrence Maddox and removed him from office in the recent election. You'll recall Maddox was the commissioner who was caught on video throwing a temper tantrum at Legoland and throwing his weight around at a service station. Maddox was defeated by Harold Johnson, a local minister. Divine intervention. And that is Ruckus for this week. Back next Thursday at 7. On behalf of the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.